Um, that's the third reason. The fourth reason, very humbly, which strikes at the root of our pride. And the fifth reason, we have to be reconciled with the church, God and the church. And this is a way to be reconciled with the church. Okay, so just to go over that. Uh, at this point, I want to uh, speak practically about the sacrament of confession. So again, uh, I encourage you to read over everything in the readings, but uh, uh, many of you will be making uh, your confession for uh, perhaps your first confession. Uh, those of you who have been baptized, uh, and for those of you, or maybe you uh, are a Catholic, but you haven't been to confession in a long time, but all of those who have been baptized uh, and who are to receive the sacrament of confirmation at the Easter vigil, uh, if I haven't heard your confession already, <laughs> or if you, if, uh, yeah, or if there's other circumstances like that, we will be uh, offering confession at, on that day of the Easter vigil. I think it's 2 p.m. Uh, or 1.30. <laughs> but so, so, and this is, this is practically how it goes. So basically, we start off, uh, in the name of the, I usually start off with, so you, you, as a priest, it's very, you get different, and sometimes people come in, they start off, <laughs> they immediately start, uh, sometimes there's just dead silence, so I start, generally I just start, uh, unless they cut me off. <laughs> but no, so I mean, usually I start in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and I usually pause for a little bit. And usually they say, please forgive me for my sins, Father. It's been so long since my last confession. If they don't, if sometimes there's just dead silence. <laughs> so I say, how long has it been since your last confession? <laughs> Uh, so that's the first thing, just to say how long has it been since your last confession. Um, and then, uh, immediately, uh, one begins going through one's sins, okay? So, here's an examination of conscience from EWTA. I highly recommend, uh, before you're in the practice of really going to confession regularly, to, to really, every time, really look at an examination of conscience, okay? Uh, so there's several on the internet. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, you can go, this one is from EWTN.com. I, I think this is a very good one, a very thorough one. Some of them really are, I mean, maybe a little too thorough. <laughs> because uh, uh, I get, for confession, we should, we're only obliged to confess sins that are serious, okay? Now, honestly, a very, uh, uh, most confessions do not involve the confession of serious sins, okay? We can say that in the general way. When people are coming to confession to uh, receive grace to just strengthen, strengthen themselves. Receive, to receive forgiveness for these sins, sometimes to seek a little counsel in, in their struggle against these sins, just practical counsel. Uh, sometimes other spiritual issues that they are struggling with that they just like a little, a few words of wisdom perhaps about those things. Uh, and, uh, but when we go to confession, not only do we receive the forgiveness for our sins, we also receive strength Precisely with regard to what we're struggling with, okay, and that we confess, okay. So uh, it's only again, it's only obligatory to to mention all serious sins in one or two words. Uh, we don't have to go into details. Some people like to give the whole story, <laughs> but. Uh, I'd recommend not to read that, especially when there's long lines. Because <laughs> there's other people who might have serious sins to confess. <laughs> I can hear their confessions too. But, uh, but generally, uh, uh, what's required is to say a few words, what the sin was, and uh, the number of times. If it's serious, the number of times. 
If it's not serious, you don't have to say it a number of times. You can just mention the sin. But for an integral confession, that's, that's what needs to be said. And to withhold the serious sin deliberately in confession um, is, uh, is a serious sin. All serious sins need to be brought to the sacrament. Okay. Um, to commit a serious sin and forget about it and go to confession, uh, if you honestly forgot about it and you go to confession, that sin is forgiven in confession. Okay? It's only sinful to deliberately withhold the sin. But if you go to confession, you confess all you remember, uh, uh, and but you forgot a serious sin, what you should do is you should uh, bring that up at your next confession. You don't have to run the confession again. Just whenever your next confession is, try to remember to bring that up. If you forget again, that's okay. <laughs> but just, if you remember, you should bring that up at your next confession, yes. Would you advise bringing a written list? I mean, if it's hard for you to remember, uh, yeah, or if there's something, uh, yeah, especially if, if it's been a long time since confession, or never since confession, but when I was validly baptized, I certainly advise bringing a list. If it's your, if it's your first confession, for sure bring a list. <laughs> okay. um, I'll also bring you a bag lunch, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, and again, like, you know, it doesn't have to take that long, though, even if it's been, I mean, you know, <laughs> You know, and, and, one, and please do not go into details, especially if it's, you know, matters of, <laughs> that I don't really want to hear all the details about. <laughs> okay. Uh, one or two words always suffices for any of those sins. Okay. <laughs> we have a word for each one of them. <laughs> but, uh, okay. And so, uh, yeah. So, uh, let me just go through, though this examination of conscience, okay? And as we go through, I just want to say, like, what is, just so you know, uh, what's serious and what's not, okay? So this is a good list of sins. You should always follow the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is these things, you can see how all these sins follow under one of the commandments. But this will give you a good way, if you don't have an examination of conscience printed out, this is what you should do. You should go through the Ten Commandments. Not the Beatitudes. That's <laughs> Those aren't, that's about perfection of dispositions. That's not, the way to, the way to go through it is the Ten Commandments, okay? <laughs> Sometimes people use the vices too. That's, that's nice. That can be helpful, but that doesn't really cover everything because if you think about it, you'll see what I mean, okay? <laughs> Like, if you think of each one of these and see, well, what vice would that Scientology, what vice does that fit under? <laughs> like, you know, the occult. Uh, I don't know. That doesn't work either. The Ten Commandments is the best way, okay? <laughs> so, all right. Um, number one. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Okay. I have sinned against religion by seriously believing in New Age, Scientology, Astrology, seriously believing in horoscopes, okay? I know people do it for fun, I read it for fun too, as long as it's fun, that's okay. But if you get serious into that, that can be very dangerous, okay? Uh, I think we discussed this before, but, you know, uh, psychics and stuff, sometimes demons can be behind them, really who give them knowledge of things, and people get caught up in them for that, and uh, that could be extremely dangerous. Fortune telling, superstition, or engaging in the occult. Okay, all of that can be really dangerous if one gets heavily involved in that, and it can be serious, and there can be serious consequences. It's basically like just opening a door to spirits to like speak to you in whatever way. Ouija boards and all of that stuff. Very, very dangerous. Uh, I know plenty of stories, I've heard plenty of confessions of like where that invited spirits to have power in people's lives in a way which was 
Uh, very scary dangers, okay? It's, it's serious stuff. All of that is serious. Most of the time, people do it without full knowledge and consent. Uh, again, a serious sin, for it to be serious fully, has to be done with full knowledge and consent. It has to be serious in nature. You have to know it's serious in nature. Not be it, you have to know it, and then also give your say. You, even though I know this is a serious sin, it's going, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. Okay. Uh, okay. Again, a serious sin deprives the soul of grace. That's why we need to go to confession uh, uh, and receive the sacrament of confession and have our sins forgiven to be restored to grace before we can approach the sacrament of the Blessed Eucharist. Uh, to take the analogy of wounds again, a venial sin is like a wound. A, 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 a wound which could be ranging from like a paper cut <laughs> to like you know, a really annoying wound, <laughs> a gaping wound. But a serious sin is one that is like a dagger to the heart, okay, or something else, which kills spiritual and spiritual life, all right? So, uh, but again, for it to really do that, one has to get full knowledge and consent to something that is in nature serious, okay? Okay. So, did I endanger my Catholic faith or cause scandal by associating with anti-Catholic groups and associations? For example, the Freemasons. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, we don't have time to go into detail <laughs> about a lot of these things. The Freemasons and their orig uh, the origin are, it is really anti-Catholic. A lot of people don't know that, but uh, it really is uh, if you get into the deeper circles and stuff. So uh, uh, if anyone has questions about that, you can ask. <laughs> okay, to deliberately do that um, in a way that would seriously endanger one's faith or cause scandal would be serious. I think very few people do that uh, with full knowledge and consent, but it would be serious in nature with full knowledge and consent. Have fame, fortune, money, career, pleasure, etc. to place God as my highest priority. Okay? To really pursue any of those things, fame, fortune, money, career, pleasure, as like one's ultimate goal in life, instead of the salvation and sanctification of one's soul. One can do this without being fully conscious of it, but one can really pursue one of those things as one's ultimate goal. To really do that, to do that with full knowledge and consent, would be, of course, making an idol in place of God. Uh, so that would be serious too. Most often, though, people do that as they divert a little. Their goal is to get to heaven. Uh, that's their ultimate goal, but eh, they divert a little bit <laughs> on the way, right? That's. Uh, how St. Thomas describes female sins. You're still going to heaven, but you just, you take a little detour over here, maybe kind of a big detour, <laughs> you know, but your goal is still to get to heaven, and um, if you indulge too much in seeking money or fortune or pleasure or whatever else, okay? Yes? What if I can't make myself feel sorry for my sins, but I know they're wrong? Uh, okay, I was going to, yeah, let's just talk about that now. Uh, there's perfect and imperfect contrition. Imperfect contrition, as we say in the act of contrition, uh, let's just read it together at the beginning of the page. Oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having offended thee, and I detest all my sins because I dread the loss of heaven and, the, and fear of the pains of hell. That could be one's only reason for being sorry for one's sin. That's imperfect contrition, okay? Fear of punishment uh, and of losing uh, eternal life. That suffices, though, for a valid confession. As long as there is the intention to, the firm intention to avoid these sins in the future. Uh, so imperfect contrition uh, uh, suffices for a valid uh, confession, okay? 
Um, the goal, though, is perfect contrition, where the second part of the statement, um, uh, I detest all my sins because of thy despisement, uh, but most of all because they have been beat by God, who are all good and worthy of all my love. That's what one's striving for. Uh, and um, uh, that, that constitutes perfect contrition. Confession, though, is made for us sinners. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's made for people who are struggling between perfect and, and imperfect and perfect contrition. You know what I mean? So, imperfect contrition does, is, suffices for a valid confession. You look still confused. <laughs> Do you have another question? Um, well, no, there's, there's a couple where I'm not even sure about the imperfect contrition, so. Okay, well, it, it's I'm, just I'm, academically speaking, I know objectively that they are wrong. That's about it. You know that who's wrong? Um, certain actions that I have committed in the past. Right. Yeah. So, uh, the part of going to confession is to bring about that whole conversion of heart. But again, fear of, I mean, we see it through the Gospels. Christ continually urges people by fear and punishment, really, and hope and the reward, which is the imperfect way. That's, that's as all the saints indicate, the imperfect Way, but that's where almost everyone starts. <laughs> that's basically where everyone starts, right? Uh, so uh, that that is a good beginning, which our Lord Himself, as we see in the Gospels again and again, uh, recommends to people as a way to to conversion of heart. And we see that all over the place in the Old Testament. In fact, Saint Thomas says that's the primary difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is for beginners who really had to be like constantly persuaded to obey God through fear of punishment, <clears throat> hope and temporal rewards. Um, and then you see less of that in the New Testament, but you still see some of it. <laughs> but uh, he's leading us to a more perfect love of him. Okay, I gotta speed up here. <laughs> but um, um, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord God in vain. Uh, we've already discussed that uh, on our on our uh, class on the second commandment. Have I committed blasphemy by using the name of God and Jesus Christ to swear rather than praise? Uh, okay, I'm just going to go through and say which how which how these might be serious. Okay, uh, to speed up, but and just to be practical here. To, again, a serious sin has to be done with full knowledge and consent. So like in a, to really blaspheme with full knowledge and consent is a serious sin. Uh, to, in anger, but with, with real, if one's able to give, one's like, one's fully aware of what one's doing and one's, and one's able to give full consent, like not even in a cloud of passion or whatever. But if one with the full knowledge and consent really says something like, God damn it, or something like that, uh, I could just say that by way, <laughs> by way of illustration. But if one says that in a, uh, like, with the intent, or with, like, contempt of God's name, or, you know, with full knowledge and consent, then that could be, then that is serious, okay? I think that's rare that that happens because I think it kind of slips off the tongue sometimes because people, you know, had a bad habit or another say it in like circumstances or something. But with full knowledge and consent, that is serious. It's taking God's holy name in vain. Have I committed sacrilege by showing dis disrespect to holy objects or contempt for religious persons or for sacred places? Uh, to really show contempt and express that would be serious. Uh, to 
to show a little disrespect, uh, especially for perhaps religious persons because of their great imperfections, <laughs> uh, would would uh, not not be serious in itself. It depends on the knowledge and consent behind it. Have I committed sacrilege by going to Holy Communion in the state of mortal sin without first going to confession after missing Mass on Sunday uh, after missing Mass on Sunday or a Holy Day? Okay, that's, that's to point out again that to go to attend Mass or a uh, Holy Day of Obligation is a serious obligation. So to do it without a real good excuse, like you're sick or you need to take care of children or something like that, um, is, is a serious sin. And for any case when we're in the state of serious sin, we need to receive confession before receiving communion. Uh, to do so, otherwise when we know, if we know we're in a state of serious sin, and we were to receive it, that would be a serious sin as well. Uh, did I violate the one hour fast before communion? Uh, uh, to do so is not a serious sin. Did I break the laws of fast and abstinence during Lent? Uh, <clears throat> that, that used to be binding under, uh, as a serious sin, I think. Uh, honestly, I'm still not exactly clear whether that's binding in a serious way. It's up for the church to say how far that is binding. Uh, but my tendency is to think it is. Uh, did I neglect my Easter duty to receive Holy Communion at least once a year? <laughs> uh, we need to, there's, we should receive Communion at least once a year. Uh, uh, I, I'm going to go a little faster because we just, <laughs> it takes too long to comment on each one of these, but have I neglected to support the church and the poor by sharing my time, talent, and treasure? Uh, did I miss Mass on any Sunday or Holy Day of Obligation? Bad weather and being sick do not count. Have I shown disrespect by leaving Mass early, not paying attention, or not joining in the prayers? Did I do unnecessary work on Sunday, which could have been done the day before? Have I been stingy in my support for the church? Do I give of my time and talent? Uh, number four, parents have, for parents, have I set the bad example for my children by casually missing mass, neglecting prayer, or ignoring my responsibilities to provide a Catholic education, either by sending my children to parochial school or CCD? Do I show little or no interest in my children's faith and practice of it? Have I showed disrespect for those in authority, government, or church? Have I not expressed my moral values to them? Uh, for children, have I been disobedient and or disrespectful to my parents or guardians? Did I neglect to help them with household chores? Have I caused them un unnecessary worry and, 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 and anxiety by my attitude, behavior, Moods, etc. Okay, under thy shall not kill. Did I consent, recommend, advise, approve, support, or have an abortion? Did I realize that there is an excommunication for anyone who procures an abortion? Uh, just to explain that a little bit, uh, uh, there is an autumn to the church to express the gravity of that sin. Uh, does attach an excommunication to the sin of abortion, which is in effect if the person knows of that. So if that's confessed in confession, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's generally confessed with, with tremendous sorrow and, and everything. So the priest is can assure you and be very compassionate of when it's confessed, but the priest will say, did you know there's an excommunication attached to this? Um, and uh, 
And if there is, a priest can absolve that. Um, so he can, by just saying in the words, I absolve you from the bond of excommunication in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And then he can proceed to forgive the sins. But the church, to show that, to kind of teach the gravity of the sin as attached to excommunication to abortion, or to, uh, in an active way, uh, uh, advising, approving, or, uh, well, not a, not advising, but like in actually cooperating to bring about the abortion by like driving someone and helping to procure them in a lot of ways like that, okay? Um, did I actively or passively cooperate as an act of euthanasia or by ordinary means or stopped or means taken to directly end the life of an elderly or sick person? Have I committed an act of violence or abuse, physical, sexual, emotional, or verbal? Have I endangered the lives of others by reckless driving or by driving under the influence of drugs or alcohol? Do I show contempt for my body by neglecting to take care of my own health? Have I been mean or unjust to anyone? Have I held a grudge or sought revenge against someone who wronged me? Do I point out others' faults and mistakes while ignoring my own? Do I complain more than I compliment? Am I ungrateful for what other people do for me? Do I tear people down rather than encourage them? Am I prejudiced against people because of their color, language, or ethnic or religious background? Um, okay, uh, just to, just so we have time for the break and everything, I'm just going to actually stop here. <laughs> if you have questions about it, you can, you can ask me a lot of times after going through, several times I've gone through an examination of conscience like this, and I, I would ask the priest, what about this, I, and, you know, is that serious or not? Confession is the time to really go through those details. But an examination of conscience like this is a great way to read about it and say, and sometimes many people have come and said, I read this examination of conscience. I don't think this is a sin. Is this really a sin? Or I don't agree with this. And confession is the place and time, the grace still place and time where you can have a very fruitful discussion along those matters. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we're not going to go through the rest, but. Uh, but you can talk to me about it uh, if you would like. I just want to uh, say a few things and have a break and then answer a few questions, okay? So, after the confession of sins, uh, the priest will usually say a few words. He might say a few words of consolation, and he might give you a little, a few words of counsel. Um, and, uh, uh, or he might not. Sometimes it's pretty straightforward and Nothing comes to the mind of the priest. <laughs> so, and it's, you know, it's frequent confession and everything, so it's pretty, often with nuns, this is the case. <laughs> and you're not going to tell them anything they don't know anyway, so, uh, no, but, uh, then they'll give you the penance, and then uh, they'll just give you the penance, which you say after the confession, and then they'll ask you to state your act of contrition. Uh, which, again, that's one version. There's a few versions you can choose from. It's always written there in the confession in case you forget. And I uh, can also repeat it after the priest. Uh, it happens several times. People forget and the priest will. And they're scared to death because they don't know their act of contrition, but it happens all the time. And you can just repeat after the priest, okay? <laughs> or say it in your own words. It doesn't have to be that exact word, though. Yes? Are we supposed to confess before Easter Vigil? Yes. So, well, uh, we will have we'll have several priests hearing confessions for for anyone who would like to go to get, myself and se several other priests who would like to go to confession that very day, just to make sure you know here as pure as possible <laughs> before receiving confirmation that day. Uh, so, uh, and you could go before them if, if you prefer. Uh, of course. So, uh, uh, but, uh, okay, so let me see. After the act of contrition, uh, 
the priest will just give absolution. And so the little formula is basically uh, God the Father of mercy through the death and resurrection of the Son has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit upon us for the forgiveness of sins. Through the ministry of the church, may God give you pardon and peace. And I absolve you from your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the actual formula when the sins are forgiven. So don't believe before the priest says that. Like a lot of people try to do. <laughs> that's the whole point. That's where it happens. <laughs> but those words, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so, and then so you, yes. Uh, from an old guy, you can always use a crib sheet. The <laughs> act of contrition. Yeah. And for you that asks the question, I always go into the list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so um, a, apart from, in general, though, people usually come with, it's not serious sins that are being confessed, but some sins like maybe gossip or uh, uh, Gossip is one of the most frequent ones. Uh, or just, you know, just uh, the outburst of anger, um, or just a general laziness and lack of prayerfulness. And they're seeking strength to, for these battles, you know. So, but they, they don't mention everything, but they mention maybe three or four of the things that are kind of maybe the roots of other things and at the heart of things and where their principles struggle. Lives. And the priest will try to help you. And whether the priest is holy or not, I get to, God gives graces to the priest to say, to help in that struggle. Okay. So uh, uh, I encourage you to maybe, as far as you can, as far as you can, try to get to the root of it too. You know, like maybe a, a lack of trust in God. Or or maybe an anger at God sometimes, or something like that, okay? All right, so it ends with absolution, and uh, usually the priest will say, or I will say, uh, your sins have been forgiven, go in peace, or something like that. And that's the end of um, <laughs> the practical nature of confession. So, uh, yes. Well, I just wanted to clarify, is everybody in their free to start going to confession now? Yeah, no, I mean, Catholics who have been baptized and who uh, uh, have, you know, who are just awaiting the sacrament of confirmation uh, should, should go to confession. Uh, uh, it's really for uh, those, those who have been baptized but uh, who were not Catholic uh, that should go to confession and uh, really... Uh, the day before the vigil, it's the time for you to go. <laughs> I mean, that would be, uh, yeah, that's that's how we usually celebrate it. That's when you would go to confession. <laughs> okay. All right, very good. Well, let's now take a break and have some light snacks for Ash Wednesday. <laughs> All right, thank you.